Good morning, everyone. Glad you could make it. So uh, my name is Miro. I work for Skim Technologies in London. And the slides for this talk, so I tried quite hard to make everything pretty large, so it should be readable. But in case you can't see it at the back, uh, here's all the slides on GitHub. I'll just hold that there for a second. Right, so um, the point of this talk is broadly speaking machine learning, but not so much the learning part of it, but more about what it is that you're learning from. And to set the context a little bit, because I imagine some of you would not be from a technical background, um, I'll give a very quick introduction to what machine learning is in about 45 seconds. So the job here is um, to get the machine to observe some input data, some information, and then give you an output. And that output should be something useful. For example, if you've got something like a user by the name of Miro, that's me, making a 14 pound transaction late, late at night on a Friday in a pub in London, uh, that's probably OK. If you're a credit card company looking to uh, remove fraudulent transactions, this, this one is about as good as they come. That's fine. That's what I do on Fridays. Um, at the same time, if you get a 1,400-pound transaction in Milan in the Versace store, that's probably not me. So you definitely want to be able to automate the process of telling between a fraudulent transaction and one that's all right. Um, and what we want to do is to get the machine to do this completely automatically, because if you're operating at scale, you're not able to do it manually. Um, here's another example, which is related to something we'll talk about later in the talk. Um, if, if you're a medical company and you're looking to kind of connect people to the right doctor, and you get a patient who comes in and says, hi, I feel a sharp pain in my chest, uh, what you want the machine to say is, this person needs to see a cardiologist and you need to see them right now. This seems like an urgent thing, right? So machine learning is basically a combination of having that data that says, if someone complains of chest pains when they run for more than 30 seconds, then they need to see a cardiologist. It's that information, and then it's the algorithms that get the machine to learn something useful from that information. And this talk is specifically about the data. So you can, you can go two ways, really, to, to achieve the task. One is you'd spend the month doing what you'd call unsupervised machine learning, where basically a human will not be aiding the machine. So the machine is just sitting there. Um, you've got some input data, but no one is telling it what it needs to produce given a particular input. But the good news is you don't need any examples like this. So no one needs to tell the machine that if someone complains of a sharp pain, that means cardiologist now, which is great because it means less work for you. But that takes forever, and it's really, really difficult to do well. Um, so the common knowledge is instead of doing a month of supervised clever machine, sorry, unsupervised clever machine learning, what you should do is get a bunch of people and spend a week building up a big, a big set of examples and then train the machine by example pretty much the same way you get trained in a school. Now, the question I want to ask here is how do we get good examples? Because as you know, the common knowledge in machine learning is garbage in, garbage out. If you're providing rubbish data, then your machine will just learn that rubbish, and you end up with nothing useful at the end and a lot of money invested into nothing. So the question is, how does garbage get created? It's, it's the process of what it is that you should be doing or shouldn't be doing to make sure that the data that you're feeding into your clever algorithm is good. Because then if it's not, regardless of how much time and how clever you are with your training, you're not going to get good results. So I'm particularly concerned with one way of getting data, and that's the manual way. So you sit down, you, you, you bring in a few humans, you show them an example, and you say, right, what should the machine say if I give this to the machine? We're not concerned with kind of large-scale data collection, the kind of NSA thing you might hear or be worried about. Um, that, that has its own interesting challenges, probably a separate talk in its own right. Um, just to mention a few of the issues, just making sure that you can actually transmit and store huge amounts of information is, is a pretty difficult task in itself. So what I'm going to be talking about is how you're dealing with humans, how you get them to give you good data. Um, and to do that, I'll, I'll focus on two case studies. The first one is 
uh, about word embeddings, and one is about symptom recognition in medical data. That's both natural language engineering. It's the kind of thing that I've done. This first one is based on my own PhD, and the second case study is based on the PhD of my friend Sasha over there in the front row. So if you want to know a lot more about that, go talk to him after the talk. Um, so okay, first case study is word embeddings. So a bit of context again. The, the task here is to get to represent words as a vector. So that's a very popular thing to do recently because the distance between those vectors uh, turns out to be very indicative of certain semantic properties. No one entirely understands what exactly is going on there, but it seems to be very useful for a lot of tasks, so people are, are really eager. And from a purely kind of computational perspective, you can do it completely unsupervised. You just download Wikipedia, run a bit of code overnight, and you get this magical representation where cat and dog end up very similar, ideally, unless you've messed something up with your pre-processing. And democracy ends up being very dissimilar. So you've captured some semantics there, and that's completely for free. All you need is just some text, no human input whatsoever. So the question I'm, I was interested in for my PhD is, how do you know if you've done a good job so there's obviously many ways you can build those vectors. Which one's better? And the way people typically dealt with that in the past, and in the past I mean starting from the 1960s up until a year ago, or well, three, um, the typical way to do it is to get humans, show them pairs of words, and ask them to give you a similarity score. So if someone says cat, dog, you should get something high, like 80%, or at least that's what most people would go for. And if you get cat in democracy, you should get a low number. So the way, we, and the way we work out whether the machine is doing well, or rather the automated model is well, is we correlate that with the human scores that we get in a psycholinguistic laboratory. So we get humans. These are the scores here on the left. Then we get the machine to produce similarity scores for the exact same word pairs. And we, if these scores match well, then we know we've built a good model. Or at least that's the theory. So this model here would not be especially good because it seems to think cat and democracy are very similar for some reason. And by the way, these are completely made up numbers, so um, don't read too much into them. So we get humans to give us the numbers on the left, and then we get the machine to give us the numbers on the right. So what I'm interested in is how do we get the humans to give us those numbers in such a way that they are actually reliable and useful for evaluation? Oh, and I, I had a picture for something that I just said. So if you just scattered the, the scores that you get between uh, between the humans and the machine. If you get a nice tight fit like this, then you've got a pretty good model. And if you get a, just a point cloud that's completely shapeless, then you know you're not doing very well. So here's a few questions here that you need to ask yourself when you're bringing those people in and asking them to provide you with similarity scores. And each of these questions are things that I should have thought in advance when I was doing my PhD, but I didn't actually. So things ended up being a lot more difficult than they should have been. So the first question is, do you actually know what is it that you're asking people to do? Like, is, is the task very clearly defined? So can you, we all have an intuitive understanding of what word similarity means, because you know, cat, dog, they sound pretty similar, right? But if you actually try to explain in, in a lot of detail to someone, if you try to pin all the corner cases, it turns out it's very difficult. So some people think that similarity is because of some kind of topical relatedness. So cats and dogs have a, um, they're kind of topically related because they're both pets, but they also have physical similarities. Four legs, tails, they're furry. Um, some people would say that you've got things like cooking and rice, which are also similar because you do both in the kitchen and they're kind of food related. But some people disagree with that. Um, You've got antonyms such as good and bad. Some people think these are very similar because they, they, they serve the same purpose in a sentence. A anywhere you can say this is good, you could also say this is bad, and it would be a perfectly grammatical sentence. But it also expresses the exact opposite thing, so it's kind of the opposite. So if you try and pin down these corner cases, it ends up being very difficult. And there's this popular academic data set called WordSim353. Um, I'll give you references at the end. And they got 13 people and asked them to rate words. And the scores they got for tiger and cat range from anywhere uh, from five to nine on a 10 point scale. So even for something which should be very obvious, like cat and tiger, you just get very, very different scores. And that's because 
the whole concept of similarity is very badly defined. Um, even if you could define your task well, some certain tasks are just very difficult to do for a human. So there's, a, there's this subjectivity involved. For example, if you're dealing with um, something like detecting sarcasm in text, that's really, really hard to do without any facial or visual cues. And it's especially hard to do out of context. If you just get a text that says, yeah, nice, or sorry, rather, yes, nice, um, in, in the absence of any voice cues and intonation, you can't really tell if someone's being sarcastic or not. So if a human can't do it, how can we expect them to give you that information of what they're doing so we can train a machine? So what can we do with that? The first and most important stage that people never, well, not never, but not very frequently think about is actually having clear instructions and starting with those very, very early and writing everything down. Um, even if you're the one doing the annotation, so especially in the beginning, you don't want to uh, go and go out, find people, ask them to do work for you. You do one round yourself to get a feel for the task, obviously. Um, even if you're doing that yourself, you should write everything down. First, for reference, because if you come back to that three weeks later, you're not going to know what you had in mind three weeks earlier. But also because writing things down helps clarify it. So ideally, then, you'd get someone else to proofread your text. You give them your instructions, and you ask them to tell you what they think you meant. Because if someone interprets your instructions differently, so will the annotators that you're going to work with. Um, if you can, obviously, you, can, you should try and make your task simpler. So if, if your business case is such that you can get away with it, there's no point in having a really, really fine-grained task if you can get away with something that's easier. And I have that picture just as an excuse to have a cat and a Superman chihuahua in the slides. But if, if your business wants to tell apart cats from dogs, all you have to do is to get humans to tell apart the cat and all these dogs. I don't actually care about the distinction between these three kinds of dogs. I don't think I could actually name these three breeds. So if I were to be brought in as an annotator and someone told me, well, this is a cat, but I have no idea what type of cat it is, and these are three different breeds and I have no idea what they are. Well, I guess this is a chihuahua, but that's about as far as my knowledge goes. And I'm not that unusual, actually, it turns out. Someone tried to do this, and it's very, very hard. So my point is, don't get your people to tell apart different dog breeds if all you care about for your business case is cat versus dog. Maybe that's just good enough. So the next question you have to worry about is whether you have quality controls in place. So there's many ways to do quality controls, and the most common mistake people make is not having any of those in place. It, it's really not that crucial how exactly you check that what you're getting is good, but at least you should be checking. Um, one of the possible ways of doing it, and I'll just mention a few ways quickly, is inter-annotator agreement, and that's a number that measures how well your different people doing the same task agree with each other. So it's basically the same example we had earlier where we were measuring the agreement between the human and the machine. In this case, we're getting two humans, asking them to do the same job. If they give us the same output, then we know that what we're getting is good. Although you do have to be careful because they might just agree by chance. If they're randomly clicking, they, there is a small probability that they will get the same result. Another option is to actually sit down and do some of the work yourself, make sure that it's very, very good quality, do it a few times, triple check everything, and then every now and then, show those examples to humans and check if they're doing well. If they match your output, then they're doing all right. Another example is to um, just insert random noise in the data and see if humans notice. The, that's probably the most effective and cheapest quality control to implement, and that's kind of what Stack Overflow does. So they have this um, review dialogue where if someone suggests an edit to a post, you can see the diff that says what's been changed in the question, and then a human needs to look at that and say, yeah, this is a valid edit that improves the question. So what they'll show you is this. The thing on the left is the original question. The thing on the right is the, the new edited question, and you need to say whether this one's okay or not. And every now and then, every 10 questions or so, they'll pop something up on screen which looks like this. Um, I don't know if you can read it at the back, but it's just completely random text inserted in the middle of a valid question. And what they're checking there is to see if you're paying attention. And if you don't, they just tell you, well, please come back when you're actually ready to help the community rather than just clicking buttons here. So that's a very, very nice and cheap way of catching people who are just there um, 
for the 17 pounds that you're going to pay them for a month worth of work. So the point about quality controls is you probably want to be running them continuously. So every, you know, ideally after every little micro task the human does. And you should watch for kind of just random errors. Maybe sometimes the person misclicks. That, that's not too big of a problem. But if they're systematically making the same mistakes, you should probably look into your own instructions. Because if you have multiple people consistently making the same error, then that's, that's probably something to do with what you've asked them to do and them misunderstanding. So it's your fault, most likely. Um, it, it helps if you're in the same room with those people so you can actually talk to them and work out why they're making that mistake. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's not something that you'd like to do, but if they're making mistakes all the time, it's just you should throw away the data and start from scratch because it's garbage. It's not going to do you any good downstream. Um, another question is how much data are you going to need? So obviously, certain algorithms improve with, with more data, and the typical learning curve is something like that. As you start throwing in more data, the model gets better. So if you see that there's a clear upwards trend, then obviously there is a point in carrying on. But that gets very expensive. So what you should be doing is looking at this learning curve and double checking that adding more data and spending more time and effort into gathering more data will be useful rather than just a waste of time. And a small aside here on the ethics of crowdsourcing. So very often what people would do is go to Amazon. They have this fantastic tool. Um, called Mechanical Turk. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And you'd offload the task and you'd pay something like one, cent, one US cent a click. And what people very often forget is that a lot of these annotators are actually doing it as a full-time job. They, they rely on that to make a living and feed their families. So just pay them properly, uh, treat them respectfully instead of just randomly throwing away their data. Because if you throw away their data, they don't get paid for it, so they go hungry at night. And especially be careful with the good ones because they're very, very hard to find. So if you find a conscientious person who's actually doing, understanding your task and doing it consistently well, they're really hard to find, so you should have a good relationship with them. So okay, so here's the case study that's based on Sasha's PhD. So again, talk to him about the details of this. Um, the, the task that we want to do here is if you have a note, so these are, these are doctor's notes. Normally when you go see your doctor, what they'll do is after you leave, they'll type some notes into your medical record that says what you talked about, what your problems are, and what you need to do later. Um, so th what you might see in a typical note, this is a made-up example, by the way, because you're not actually allowed to look at those, is abdominal pain due to tonsillitis. And what we want to find out here is that the symptom is abdominal pain and the potential cause is acute bacterial tonsillitis. And we want to be able to do that automatically to help doctors identify possible diseases that they might have missed because they are underfunded. So that sounds very easy, but it's actually not. Um, and there's a few issues here. The first one is that doctors are actually very, very busy. So the moment you leave the room, they have about one minute to write down everything that you talked about. So what you end up with is something that's even worse than Twitter. So there's a ton of typos, lots and lots of typos. They'll use non-standard punctuation. Um, I have seen cases where they just go, oh, for a slash instead of a full stop, because why not? I can do that. And um, there's a lot of terminology, like this B tons. Unless you're, ha unless you're a medical professional, you're not going to know what, what this means. So it's, it is very, very messy. Messy to the point where you can't even just find the boundaries between the words, because you never know whether this whole thing here, P -an acute, is a single thing with a slash in it, the same way as N-A is a single word, or it's two words. So even the most fundamental natural language processing task, like breaking words down, gets very, very difficult in, in medical text. So the, qu the question is, OK, right, we're going to be bringing people in, and we're going to be asking them to annotate this data so we can train the machine to find symptoms. Now, can anyone do it? You, you can't just get a guy off the street and ask them to do this for you, because it needs to be done by a trained physician. And they don't like to do that very much. They prefer to practice medicine and heal people. So we need to work very, very hard to actually find those people, 
convince them to come work with you, and not just for an hour, because they'll get bored extremely quickly. You need to convince them to come in consistently, because once you've trained them up, you need to be able to use that knowledge that they've accumulated. Um, the next problem is they're typically not experts in linguistics. So what you tell them is, right, a symptom needs to be a fully qualified noun phrase, and they go, sorry, a noun what? And of course, I don't blame them. I don't expect anyone, unless they're like a trained linguist, to know what a noun phrase is. Or, or then, you know, they do some annotation and you suddenly go, well, yeah, your standard deviation is quite high over time, mate. You, you know, something's not quite right here. So it's very, very hard to talk to people if you don't have a common vocabulary, um, to the point where you can't even explain to them what it is that you're asking them to do. Um, and what you end up with is, is cases like that. Some people go, well, obviously pain is the symptom here. It, it's irrelevant that it's abdominal. And, and someone might say, well, we have here, it's bacterial tonsillitis. I can see that it's bacterial. It's irrelevant that it's acute because that's a subjective thing. You, do, you don't seem particularly ill to me, right? So that's the symptom. Acute is not a part of the symptom. Um, someone might say, well, it's clearly acute. The fact that it's bacterial is yet to be confirmed because we haven't done a test. It could be viral. But it seems quite inflamed to me, so I reckon it's acute. So the point here is, even if you're doing quality controls, um, it's not as easy to actually measure agreement. In the, word, uh, in the word similarity task we talked about earlier, it's quite easy. You just uh, do that scatter plot. If you have a tight fit, then it's a good fit. It, every statistical package will have a Pearson correlation implementation really easy. In this case, with, with these massive chunks that could be, um, that could overlap, they could be have, could have gaps in them, they could be missing altogether. It, it becomes much harder to even understand if your humans are doing well, because you don't know whether what two people are giving you is the same, or rather you can't put a number to that. Um, it's not a simple correlation anymore. So if you want to kind of read some more, there's a 20 paper, 20 pager here by Art Stein and Poesio, and then Sasha wrote a fair bit about this in his PhD. Um, it is quite an interesting problem, but it involves a lot of tricky corner cases and a ton of rules to, to write down. The, the third question is, if you're, if you're bringing people in and asking them to do work for you, you need to provide them with some software. So in the word similarity case, a text editor is good enough. So you just go, cat, dog, please fill in the gap. So you don't need any specialist tooling. Here, you need something that would enable them to select symptoms, select whether they're symptoms or, or su suspected symptoms, and so on and so on. So you need some kind of special software. That software obviously has to be bug-free, because no one wants to use buggy software. Um, if you're dealing with medical data, you cannot use a cloud provider because that's a big no-no. It needs to, it's extremely sensitive. Uh, you need to make sure that you can host it yourself, which means a lot more DevOps work for you. You need to have data security. Like if, if a, a particular annotator is only allowed to access a small subset of the data, they shouldn't be able to see everything else because that's private. Um, that tooling ideally would let you do quality controls, and they do it automatically and all the time. And Purely from a practical point of view, you want a piece of software that's easy to install if you're getting something off the shelf, or you want something that's easy to write if you're doing it yourself, because that adds up very quickly. You could easily spend weeks here just writing software without getting any data. And from a kind of people's point of view, you definitely need something that's easy to use, especially if you're going crowdsourcing through Amazon. You'd be surprised by how many people there don't really know what right-clicking means. So the bar needs to be very, very low. The tool needs to be very simple, and it needs to not get in the way. It should be enabling people rather than getting in their way and making it hard for them. And one typical example that you've seen, you, you see a lot in these tools, is once you annotate something, you can't go back. So if you misclick, well, that's it. You don't get paid for that. And again, bug-free, because no one wants to use it if it's buggy. So there's many tools like that. There's Crowdflower, there's Mechanical Turk by Amazon. The screenshot down here is from BRAT, which stands for Rapid Annotation or something like that. Or you could write something in-house. Um, each of those has its own issues. So Crowdflower and Mechanical Turk, they do a lot of the work for you. They find annotators, but you have to set up the task. So there's a little bit of a steep learning curve initially. Um, BRAT, 
when, when Sasha was using it, that was like three or four years ago, this took easily a week to install because it was a mixture of PHP and Python running on Apache behind the firewall, because you obviously can't put it on Amazon. It has to be on your private network. So the whole thing is just a very, very unpleasant experience. It takes a whole week just to get started. And the, the final kind of set of issues that you're going to be encountering here when you're dealing with people is just people issues. And the, my controversial claim is that if you can find a good annotator who's giving you decent data all the time, they're going to contribute more to the success of your project than your entire team of programmers. Simply because that data is pure gold. You run, if, if it's good quality, easy data, you just run a, a simplest machine learning algorithm on top of it and you get value. And if it's rubbish, you can, you can have an entire team of data scientists doing things. They're not going to get anywhere because you can't learn from random noise. So if you find a good person, just make sure you build a good relationship with them, even be friends, or at least treat them with, treat them with respect. Um, it, it helps very much to be in the same room, because then you'd be able to, to work out if they have any misconceptions about what you're asking them to do. Um, but it also helps you to learn about the problem. So when you're there and you tell them, oh, find me a noun phrase, and then they can't identify a noun phrase in your sentence, well, maybe you don't really need a noun phrase. Maybe you just need to word it differently. Or maybe you don't even want nouns at all. Maybe you just want verbs. So it, if you don't understand what the task is, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, it, it's very useful if you have a tutorial, because people forget, especially if that's not their area of expertise. So doctors come in, they do the training, they get pretty good at it in a couple of days, and then they go on holiday for six weeks. And then when they come back, they, again, they don't remember what the noun phrase is. So you'd have to have a good mechanism to make sure that they don't forget, or if they do, they need to be retrained. And of course, there's the usual day-to-day -day things like, oh, sorry, I'm not feeling that well, I can't come in today. Well, yes, but I was, I was kind of counting on you to come in today because I need your data to do my next round of experiments. Or I have seen cases where people say, oh, could I maybe just work from home? And when, when they work from home, their data is completely random. They just look out the window and stroke their cat. Whereas when they come into your office under supervision, they do a fantastic job. So there's these annoying little things that kind of management issues that you have to worry about. And they always, may, they always mean that you end up underestimating the complexity of getting some labeled data. Because you always think, oh, yeah, no worries. I'll just bring in three guys. They'll do it in a day. It doesn't take a day. It takes a week or a month. Um, so a quick note here on crowdsourcing. I have brought it up very quickly repeatedly. You get all the same issues as above. And on top of that, you get a whole lot of new things. So um, you get people in, in India, for example, or well, not necessarily in India. In India, actually, it's probably a bad example. But you, let's say you're labeling data in English, and you get a bunch of people from Eastern Europe um, whose command of English is not so fantastic. Maybe for your case, that's OK. But if you want medical data, you definitely want a native English speaker lab and also a doctor doing your data. So you need, to be f you need to be filtering. And obviously, when they're not in the same room as you, they're somewhere you know, anywhere on the globe, you can't know who they are. So you end up with a lot of people who just randomly click because they get paid a bit of money for every click. So they want to do it faster and be done with it to make some more money. And um, there's also a kind of a learning curve. So there's, there's the learning curve for them because they, they need to rely on your very short instructions on Crowdflower instead of you, them coming in and having a three-hour conversation with you about all the subtleties of finding noun phrases. So all right, in summary, it's very, very good if you know your own problem domain. So if you don't understand what, the, what you're trying to do, then you can't get others to understand it and do it for you. Um, inevitably, as you start talking to people, you will find that there are some assumptions that you made that are not justified. So you, it's, it's very, very hard, but you should be able to just let go. If you find out that you've done something completely the wrong way, you should just go, right, bin it, start over. Um, if you can, sorry, not if you can, but you should be monitoring quality, ideally continuously, because otherwise you end up with nothing that's good for you. And if you are crowdsourcing, just be extra careful because you can't control who's clicking what. You end up with lots of data, but it might be even noisier than usual. All right, that's it. Thank you.
Um, the question is, how much do we pay for a click? The answer is, I don't actually use Amazon for that because, well, a few reasons that I've mentioned already. So people typically pay anywhere between one and 10 cents, depending on the complexity. So for something like a word similarity task, it's a very, very low friction. You can do 60 of those a minute, so one cent is quite justified. Um, if it's a more complex task, like there's an entire receipt, can you transcribe every single character on it? Then you obviously should pay more. Um, it, it helps very much if you do the job yourself. And, and kind of think about how much you can make if, if that was your job. And if the answer is $2 an hour, then it's probably too little. Um, there's a question at the back there. Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak up? So uh, it's about the first case study, and I, I hope you, are, you have actually used the word to vec model or, or doc to vec model for, uh, for generating the word embeddings. Yeah. So in that case, the similarity between, of course, the cat and dog is fine. For example, also in the word to vec model, you get good and bad as similar ones. Mm -hmm. So how do you make people understand that uh, good and bad are kind of similar? Because uh, in those cases, word to vec actually performed better, because that's how it works. But people cannot understand how word to vec works, so they may not evaluate good and bad as similar ones. Well, this is kind of independent of word to vec So the fact that good and bad end up being similar is just a side effect of the fact that they appear in the same context, so word to vec is learning to make them similar. But the, the, the question here was a more fundamental one that's completely um, independent from any particular algorithm. So should they be similar or should they not? It should be similar because that's how word to vec works, and if uh, word to vec actually works in an ideal condition, it's uh, people should name it similar, right? I well, mean, if they if they actually uh, evaluate it as false one, then it means that word to vec is not working good. But what if I want to know if word to vec is working well, right? Suppose I'm Thomas Miko of five years ago, and I've just built word to vec and I don't know. So if you basically told me that because that's how word to vec works, that's the right result. But if, if I've just built it and some stuff has come out, how do I know if it's working or not? So are you evaluating the model or are you evaluating the, the, the target uh, idea of what you are working on? Well, ideally, those should be the same. So the model should be a model of semantics. So what I want to be evaluating is if it's learning useful word representations. So if I, as a human, believe that good and bad are dissimilar, then the model should be learning that as well. Okay, let's, uh, okay thank you. <laughs> uh, come, back, come back after this. Yes. Yes. When you annotate data, is there a certain threshold you're aiming for uh, while annotating it? Because you can have to aim for 100% precision on your training data. Mm -hmm. So do you have this? Threshold and the second one is, assuming it's below the threshold, do you adapt your models according to the precision of the training data? Um, so when you when you say precision, do you mean agreement or quality or quality of it? Let's say it's a deterministic task uh -huh. and you want it, and you want it to be well labeled. So out of all the labels, 95 okay. percent can be right. Is there such a threshold you're working uh, with? Well, yeah, but it's not a number, so you're probably not going to like this answer. It's as low as you can get away with, depending on what you're doing. So if, if your business case allows you to work with crappy data, which is not, well, I shouldn't say crappy. You know what they say, don't let perfect get in the way of good. So if, if, if your data is imperfect and it's 96%, and 96 turns out to be good enough for your task, then perfect, you've achieved what you set out to do. It doesn't have to be at, at 100. Sometimes 70% ends up OK. It's still much better than not having anything there. Sorry? So the question is will it affect your model? Yes, obviously. Rubbish data um, will affect your model. 
but if the model ends up being good enough in the end, it's fine. So normally, academic literature would say that good agreement is about a correlation of 0.6 or above, which isn't actually that much. But if it works for you, hey. I mean, Sasha, how much was your agreement? Do you remember? So 0.87, which is pretty high, and still the, the models that ended up being built on that had a lot of issues. So the problem there wasn't so much with the agreement, it's, big, it's the sparsity of the data and the real complexity of the task. So I guess there it was more about not having enough good quality data. The data that he had was good, it's just it, it's physically impossible within the space of a PhD to get much more than that. Thank you. More, more questions? Thank you.